Hi, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. Um, we are just going to get started pretty quickly. I think everyone knows who Simone and Kenny are. I think their reputations precede them. And also, if I start reading off their resumes, we will only have like 20 minutes left to actually talk about anything. So <laughs> I figure that we can just head right in. Um, obviously, we're all here today <laughs> because of the galleries part of Talking Galleries. That's kind of our focus. So I want to try to keep the issues focused as much on galleries as I can. But a big trend that's been taking place in the art market over the course of the past 10, 15 years especially has been that there's a lot of sort of blurring of boundaries. Like most primary market galleries now sell secondary market work. You have auction houses that are doing private dealing. Um, even biennials, I think people now basically regard as selling exhibitions. So these are, these are big changes that have happened from previous decades. And I'm just curious, since both of you have been around in this game for a long time, how do you feel about all this kind of blurring of boundaries? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it just the way it is? Yes, to you. Well, yes, maybe uh, since I've been around the longest, um, I personally think it's a good thing because uh, there are all these barriers and I think it's always good when barriers are broken down and at least uh, blurred. And I had in my long professional life the privilege of, in a way, uh, doing literally every permutation of what you can do in the art world, from being an artist to a curator to a museum director to an art uh, gallerist and to an auctioneer. And um, uh, I, I think it's okay for, for the boundaries to be blurred. And they've been blurred for, I would say, even longer than the last 10, 15 years because uh, the auction houses have started doing private treaty transactions for quite a bit longer than that. For the last 25 years, I think, the main auction houses have developed uh, private sales teams to complement the activity of the main auctions. And uh, that is because they, even the big auction houses, even with the situation of a uh, what used to be a duopoly, uh, do need the complement of the private sales to you know, be more profitable and to do better. And also, they are in a very good position to do private sales because auctions give you all the information you want to know who are the potential buyers, who's out there looking for what. And at each auction, you not only know who bought the, main, the lot, but you also know who are the other people who are trying to get the lot. So when you have an artwork that is entrusted to you for a private sale, you can proceed in a very targeted way and try and sell it effectively this way. Kenny, what are your thoughts on Well, all this? I agree. I mean, I agree 100%. I mean, I think dilettantism used to be something that was celebrated in the world, people doing different things. And I've always been of the mind that you should do any damn thing you want in any which way you like to, as long as you're not hurting anyone or breaking any laws. So I remember in one of the many times I've been rejected from art fairs, having had a project space myself, a lot of the times I would hear comments like, literally, this is quote unquote from people like from Fries and Basel even, who does Kenny think he is? He could make art one day, like you mentioned, or write about it and curate shows and deal it. Who does he think he is? As if this was some kind of crime that I was committing. So I think, I mean, some of this kind of blurring can go too far when some collaborations I see breaking down these barriers of who's an artist and who's not. There are good points and bad points to everything, a bell's curve of quality, but I mean, people should do what they want, how they want it, and the art world should be about freedom and the lack of rules rather than the reverse. I mean, even I'll just make, there was an article by Jerry Saltz, which I thought was a fabulous article recently, like 33 rules to be an artist. And I would reduce that to one rule and say there are no rules and one should do and approach this field in any way they can to do so creatively with good faith. And you know what is so interesting? So many people in the art market or in the museum world uh, are all failed artists. Uh, I, I'm well placed to know because I am one of them. Uh, when I was a teenager, my dream was to become an artist, not to become an art dealer. Uh, not having been able to realize my first dream, I'm very happy to have realized my second dream. But uh, it's so interesting to see how many art dealers uh, have been artists before and are quite ashamed speaking about it. It's 
with something that you will not see in their CVs that they suddenly become very silent about. But a lot of museum directors, for Thomas Krenz, for instance, the uh, Geneva Museum owns some works by Thomas Krenz. Nobody knows that he was also an artist at some stage. Or Roger Mandel, uh, the uh, former um, uh, deputy director of the National Gallery in Washington, uh, was an artist. Jeffrey Deitch was an artist. Ernst Beiler was an artist. Jan Krugier was an artist. One could do once a horrendous exhibition <laughs> with uh, artworks done by uh, gallerists and art dealers. But there's a reason why this is like that. Because when you're an artist, you, you learn how to use materials. I went to the Tokyo Academy of Arts. I, I used Japanese brushes, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, ink pot, the, ja the Japanese ink thing when you, you rub your stone and create your ink yourself and all that. It, it learns... You know, teaches your eye to look at things. To I think it, 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 it is actually a very good thing to have been an artist yourself, or at least attempt to, to, attempted to be an artist yourself, and uh, it helps you to maybe sharpen your eye. Well, I, I think that this is this is an interesting discussion because of the idea that I, I feel like most people who were involved in the art world got into it in some capacity because it was a really it was regarded as like a very open space. This is a place where anything goes, you can kind of write your own rules. And now we're we're in this phase where the art market itself is becoming valuable enough that I feel like it's it's industrializing to a certain point. So we're sort of trapped in between these these two sort of I don't know dimensions almost where there's the do anything anything goes sort of art side of it and then there's also well, there's a lot of money to be made here, and we should like have rules and distinct ways that things are done. And like the clash of those things, I think is extremely interesting. And I don't know how it resolves. Maybe it doesn't. Is this just how it's going to be? We're just going to keep kind of going on this this path that we're on. This path in terms of people. Well, I I would say of assuming of, different roles. Yeah, yeah, just um, being. And I mean, Kenny, you're obviously you're an interesting case here because you are. I mean, you're going to have a show in Freeze L.A. And speaking of. Galleries making failed art shows. Right. I'm about to have another one in February in LA. <laughs> right. So, so I mean, I guess on some level, what I kind of hear both of you saying is that maybe things aren't really as different as we thought. Maybe people have kind of always been dancing between roles. And I, I don't know. Is it, is it just like I think more one version? thing which has changed is that when I started wanting to be an artist, it was this very romantic uh, notion of being an artist. And it was la, la vie bohème. It, it was, uh, whereas now, when you go and visit uh, young artists, which is still the favorite thing I do in my professional life, is some of them you feel, uh, you know, you have to be there very much on time. It, uh, they see you, it's like going to see a banker. And uh, they ask you questions. How, how many works should I produce per year? Uh, uh, how, how much can I do without uh, flooding the market? And how can I make as much money as I can in the shortest amount of time? And some very blunt questions that you would have expected a young guy becoming a stockbroker mm -hmm. ask you. And um, you, you have far less this experience of arriving to an artist who is completely, uh, you know, uh, dans la lune, as you say in French, who's, who's distressed distracted and, and is not as, <laughs> as organized. And, and some artists uh, have studied very carefully the, the mechanisms of the market and, 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 and the marketing of art itself. And it's fascinating. That's where I feel there is a great change in the attitude of some of the young artists. One should never generalize. But uh, that is probably the result of the art market has it, having become what it is today, with, with the level of prices having gone exponentially. And so it's understandable that there are also that type of vocations amongst young artists. When I started on the art market, people said, oh, my, they were uh, speaking to my parents and com commiserating, uh, how terrible to have a son who goes into <laughs> the art world, uh, as opposed to become a lawyer or, or going into the banking world. Right. Well, okay, that, that brings up an interesting subject, just in the terms of uh, the scale of these transactions that we're going into and, and the prices that are, I mean, attaching themselves to this. So I, I want to bring up a, a moment in the HBO documentary, The Price of Everything, which I'm sure some people in the audience have seen. Um, early on, Simone appears, 
and he makes a statement that, and I'm going to quote here, <laughs> it's important for good art to be expensive because you only care for and protect things with a high value. <clears throat> now, Kenny, you reviewed this film, and you called out that particular comment by Simone, uh -oh. and you said, and, and I quote, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're in very good company because the <laughs> New York view of books, which I just read yesterday, has been even more damning than you were, Kenny, which is amazing. <laughs> and I'm not and yet. several other people who've seen the movie. So, well, you, um, you. What? so, so Kenny's response was, and again, I quote, if that woefully misguided notion were ever to have taken hold, which it hasn't, we'd be left with nothing more than the market art of the moment. No thanks. So... What, what I'm trying to say, I mean, with all due respect and love to my friend over here, I mean, it's the art that has no market that needs to be preserved, really, in essence. You think about artists that, I mean, there are a few artists in my career that I've been closely associated with. One is uh, the conceptual artist who died a few years ago, Vito Acanci. I mean, it's not that there was a small market, there was basically no market. And another artist who died in 1988, the American artist Paul Tech, he died destitute. There was only one museum in the whole of America that had a simple drawing by his. So it's really, you have to search for quality that is, I mean, I say that art and money have been in bed for a million years, but they don't spend the night in the same bed. They separate. And you really have to look beyond the financial return to see, to protect art. Art, art and artists on some level need to be, to be protected in a simple way. The body of work, if there's no value, could get discarded and fall by the wayside, and that's a tragedy. So I will attempt to defend my statement, which has been uh, uh, said as being phenomenally silly. But uh, there are two anecdotes, maybe, which illustrate why I, I, I have come to that conclusion. One of my, my, in fact, my very first job at Sotheby's 100 years ago was at the front counter uh, in, in uh, New Bond Street. And the front counter, all day long, you have people who come with little plastic bags with objects, ceramics or a piece of silver or whatever it is, and want to get an estimate on it. And so one day came an elderly, lovely uh, uh, couple and they had a huge uh, kind of parcel and they took 45 minutes to unwrap it very, very carefully and with incredible amount of caution and ex explaining to me that this was a family heirloom that had been forever in the family and they were all cherishing it and all that, but that now the moment had come where they had decided reluctantly to cash in. And when finally, finally, it was unwrapped, um, the expert of Sotheby's came down and looked at it and tried to convey as diplomatically as possible that there was, it, it might be a very nice heirloom, but there was zero commercial value. The minute he said there's zero commercial value, they threw the stuff back into the box and <laughs> There was with no care at all, and I thought, how is it possible that uh, a family that for years has cherished this, and the minute they know that there is no financial value added to it, they no longer view this as worthwhile protecting. So that's one example, uh, which I thought was very telling. The other example is, in 1983, uh, I organized an exhibition, uh, which an exchange exhibition between the uh, Hermitage Museum and the Pushkin Museum and Baron Thyssen Bornemisa's private collection, which was before it moved to Spain, when it was still at the Villa Favorita in Lugano. And this was at the height of the Cold War, and all the paintings that were shown at the Fondation uh, Louis Vuitton last year from the Shukin and Morozov collection, the masterworks by Picasso, by Gauguin, by Matisse, by Van Gogh uh, and Monet, uh, all these masterworks were shown uh, in 1983 in the private home of one of the greatest capitalists. And this was in the days of Brezhnev, so you have to <laughs> realize what, what this meant. And for this, to this day is the most successful exhibition that ever took place in Switzerland. Uh, 460,000 people saw it while, I was, while it was on display. So on the last day of the exhibition, we did a party, a sort of a closing party, and half of the guests were uh, uh, ministry officials from the Soviet Ministry of Culture, okay. and the other half of the guests were uh, major private collectors from around the world. And uh, a, a gypsy band was invited, and a fantastic gypsy musician, he was called Dr. Zuch, <laughs> got so carried away, we were having dinner in the room where all the Tahitian Gauguins were hung. And 
I thought, my God, I, as curator, I've, I've survived this exhibition for five months and all these paintings remained intact despite these hundreds of thousands of visitors. And now I have to witness how Dr. Zuch with his, uh, um, how do you say, bow of, of his violin is going to pierce these <laughs> incredible gogas. So all the time I would go to Dr. Zuch in the middle of his performance and please, 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 don't go so close to the to the paintings. Nothing could do. His temperament mm -hmm. was far uh, stronger than my comments. And then finally, I thought, after all, each one of these gogas is worth at least six million dollars. You may think this is a ridiculous little price, but uh, at that in those days, in 1983, this was a whacking price. Anyway, so I went to Dr. Zuch and I said, "Please, this is worth six million dollars." And when he heard six million dollars, even in his temperament and all of that, I saw Dr. Zuch uh, <laughs> listening and he tempered a little bit his playing and the Tahitian Gauguin's from the Hermitage and the Pushkin survived the evening. So this is to demonstrate it's very important, like uh, it's very important that there is an antiquities market. If there is no more antiquities market, no antiquities will be preserved because every time a construction site falls onto great artifacts, it, uh, why should they hold back and, and uh, delay the construction? Nobody is going to take care. That's why I do my profession out of passion, out of love, out of idealism. However, I am also observant and I see that it is a financial value that gives people the incentive to protect it and wanting to make sure that it does not get destroyed. Of course, I love Vito Acconci and I bought from Kenny Schachter mm -hmm. a desk, which was his desk that he commissioned from Vito Acconci and at the time when Vito Acconci was not yet this towering figure and I love every day that I've spent on mm -hmm. this Vito Acconci desk. I mean, on the other hand, there was a collector that had a Van Gogh painting, which was his most cherished possession in his life. Then an expert came in and told him it was a fake, and he chucked it into his attic and never saw it again, and it turned out to be real. So these differing perceptions can vary and change retroactively. Yeah. And I would also just add for that... <laughs> no, if you know, like it. but it, it's so true because subliminally, when you hear that the painting is worth suddenly a lot of money, uh, suddenly the comments about the paintings will start changing. I mean, you see that at auction sometimes. When a work that was expected to bring one type of price suddenly brings 10 times that price, uh, people will suddenly hold back in terms of their criticism mm -hmm. somehow. Both, I say like a fake art is like a fake orgasm. If you have this Van Gogh hanging in your house and you think it's real <laughs> and it was fake, you're the happiest camper in the world as long as you don't know about it. Once you know and it's this different like philosophical position you take in relationship to this object, it's kind of funny. Well, wow, okay, there are a lot of directions <laughs> we can go with this. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, let's, 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 let's stay on the Vito Acconci thing because I think that this, this is interesting. Um, not the fake orgasm. Though. Not the fake orgasm. <laughs> thing. Uh, so, I mean, Kenny, you bring up Vito, I'm assuming, because obviously he's not, not a practice that is particularly market friendly, generally speaking. And yet, his estate is now represented by Pace, if I'm not mistaken. It went to Sotheby's, believe it or not. Exactly. And Back then, to the blurring of distinctions. Right. Exactly. So, what are we supposed to make of that if we have an artist who you're saying was valuable? separate from the market entirely. He was doing very progressive things, they were really breaking down boundaries, and now all of a sudden he, I'm not gonna say he's become a market artist, but certainly the market has taken an interest in him no. that it didn't do before. Well, first of all, I mean, it was a shocking story. When he passed away, four days before he died, I had a phone call from Sotheby's asking for a recounting of all the pieces that I had collected over decades, which I thought, I mean, he was in his sick bed, and already they were making preparations for his imminent death, which was pretty crass and in bad taste, if you ask me. Then Sotheby's couldn't deal with the estate because it's all but unmanageable because of various other situations, and they were going to work in conjunction with Pace, and then Sotheby's walked away from it. Now, like back to the blurring of distinctions, the auction houses are getting into representation of primary artists, estate management, career management, gallery management. So like art agency partners in Sotheby's in particular is really trying to broaden the scope of what the auction houses per se do, as opposed to galleries that are taking guarantees now and being more progressive and proactive in terms of their financial participation in the market. 
but what was the question again about? Oh, so I, anyway, vetoed to this day, I mean, Pace did pick up representation. I've curated a Paul Tech show at Pace in the past, and I would love to get involved with Vito's body of work. But at this point, there's, there's still little or no market. And someone who was a paradigm-shifting force of nature in the world of conceptual art, and to this day, his body of work is still being assimilated and digested. But if it's not, like, basically, Vito, like, the art world likes to affirm success. So you see series upon series that artists create, 300 of this kind of painting, 400 of that painting, and Vito just flitted from one body of work to the next, and he was, he was dismissed because of that. He went from making art about his body, performative work, sculpture, installation. In the end, he was doing furniture and full-blown architecture, and at that point, he basically was all but dead for all intents and purposes, market-wise. But it will still happen. I agree. I mean, I, my family, because I've just been such a proponent of this work for so long, I mean, that's the closest I got to getting divorced was the fact that I was continuing to embrace this work and my family was scratching their heads thinking that I was a bit mad and wasting time and resources. <laughs> well, okay. So, um, Ken, you brought, up, uh, you brought up guarantees in the midst of all this. And that is another kind of very hot topic in the art market now. And... We've we've gone from a point, and, and Simone, I'm sure that you know the history better than I do, but I mean, guarantees, just straight up guarantees, have been around for many, many years. This is not a new idea. That said, we're now getting into this zone where we have not just straight auction house to consigner guarantees, now we have third party guarantees, we have irrevocable bids, we have these other kind of complex arrangements, the dollar figures are getting crazier and crazier, you have a higher and higher proportion of lots at any given auction that have a guarantee attached to them. Is this all getting out of control? Like, has, has the financialization of the auction market gone too far at this point? And regardless of the answer, like, what kind of effect do you think that's having when it comes to, not the auction market, but like the day-to-day -day business of galleries? After you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> My default. Yes. Listen, I, I think the market will always evolve, and, and uh, that's why I think a forum like Talking Galleries is particularly interesting, because when to listen from professionals how they feel the market is going to change structurally, because the art market of all markets is the most conservative one, and the one that has tried hardest to... Uh, protect the status quo and not uh, and resisting change and but you you can only resist change up to a point and then uh, change catch it up up with you so um, I, I think that for owners of very important artworks uh, the guarantees has been a way of minimizing the risk or eliminating the risk of putting something for up for auction it's basically allowing you to have your cake and eat it uh, i.e you know what you will receive in the worst case uh, but you still don't eliminate the best case uh, whereas in a private transaction you know what you're getting but you won't have suddenly a very very pleasant surprise and, and you cut out the bad surprise. Now, uh, which means that if you go to big evening sale, there's no longer a lot of suspense. I mean, you're just going to see, okay, is it going to go beyond the third party guarantee or not? But the auctioneer, and I conducted many auctions, uh, evening sales at Sotheby's in New York and during the 90s, and believe me, it was very different in those days. So you came to the star lots of the sale and you, you didn't know, of course, what the preliminary interest had been before the auction, but you did not know if it was going to sell. And I remember going up on the podium and the uh, uh, then CEO uh, telling me, you realize that a quarter of the year is now in your uh, hands. <laughs> and so it makes you even more tense and nervous. And whereas now, when you know that your star lots are all covered, you know, it must be still an, an exciting uh, thing to do, but slightly more relaxing experience. <laughs> now, uh, what I'm most intrigued by, and uh, uh, Kenny knows this uh, example, is the following. I think what will change, potentially, is the whole concept of ownership, because now the art market is limited for the uh, to a small group of the super wealthy, and we see that economically we go towards a world where the 0.1 of the 0.1 percent is going to become more and more and more and more uh, wealthy, and so I think that the 
uh, blue chip art, the ultimate trophies, are going to become more and more expensive as a result of it. And we will see price levels that we never thought of as possible. Whereas the big, big problem is going to be all of the rest. And so the question is, how will that market evolve? And, and now I tell this example. There's this young Swiss gentleman in Switzerland who had a website where he was selling secondhand Rolexes. And they were being snapped up by all his clientele. And then one day, he was offered a very moderate quality Picasso for $3 million. And he thought, why don't I try this out with my database <coughs> of Rolex buyers? He puts it on his website, and 12 hours later, 12 hours later, do you hear me? Yes, 12 hours later, he had raised the $12 million. If you had asked me to sell this work privately, it would have taken me much longer than 12 hours to, to sell it for $3 million. Anyway, 36,000 people all put up money to, uh, to buy this uh, $3 million picture. Now, ah, much better. So uh, he then went to the Geneva Museum and he said, can you hang this Picasso? And um, they were delighted because th they never have many visitors and suddenly they had the 36,000 people who all wanted to show off that they owned a piece of that uh, work. He also asked, if could you have a camera, 24-7 camera, that shows this painting? So all these 36,000 owners can now show off on their cell phone that they own a tiny, tiny little piece of that work. Now, um, I think we are in a time when concept of ownerships are completely evolving. Um, you know, we used to own cars. I don't own a car anymore. We, I had the largest vi vinyl collection in the world. No, not quite, but <laughs> substantial. And then CDs and all of that. Then I became the best downloader of mm. Apple Music in the world. And now I, I just am um, uh, on Spotify. So um, <laughs> I, I think if it opens the idea if this is not going to completely change the market and that the uh, pace has just uh, created a new company which is for artists that are um, doing special experiences like um, this Team Japanese Lab. collective Team Lab, Team Lab or Studio Drift right. or, um, or, uh, or if, if you look for instance at Yayoi Kusama, her infinity rooms, you have thousands and thousands of people who go and pay money and queue for hours to try and see it. And so you can really cash in on an artwork just by sending it on a worldwide tour and nobody's ever going to own it. It's a completely different model, but there are different ways now going forward sure. which will transform the market as we know it. And that's what I find exciting. Can I say, <laughs> that was a long slope from guarantees, but back to, <laughs> back to auctions. I mean, the job of an auctioneer is basically to get people to sell things they don't want to sell, to buy things they don't want to buy, in the basic sense. So guarantees, in a way, are a way for the auction houses to free up work, to continue to have fodder to sell on the market. But I think the important thing is, like, I mean, the way capitalism started, the way people were trading goods amongst each other and buying and selling goods and so forth, which defined the underpinnings of capitalism, that changed over the course of financial history where there became something called like financial capitalism. So there's money, moving money around, money investing in money, and you have these derivatives of all of these investment vehicles, and that's what's happened to art. So really, art is in no way any different from any other aspect of, of culture and humanity and economics. So the art world is just mirroring. As people pay more and more attention to art, as more escalating values are attached to these artifacts, then, you know, a, whenever there's large sums of money involved, there's, con there's, there's, there's commensurate crime that comes to the fore. But also, it's, art has mirrored these types of investments. Of, so the guarantees have become a kind of derivative investment, where people are third-party guarantees. It's just a new modality to participate in the art market as a financial vehicle. And whether it's good or bad and trickles down to help younger artists, it's, it is what it is, and it's really, it just, in my mind, it just draws more people into the fore and increases the breadth of the overall market. In terms of these fractional ownership situations, I'm very disbelieving that this will ever catch on and never be more than a novelty. I just think the whole part of art, 
is living with art, existing with art. I mean, I remember when I first started curating exhibitions, working with young and emerging artists, I found it to be very difficult because young artists, they're all, I mean, it's very competitive to become successful and I found it very demanding to work with young artists that are always looking past you to see what the next opportunity is, where they can step over to get to a better gallery, better clientele, better collectors and so forth. Um, so, where was I? <laughs> <laughs> I think Dr. Zuch was involved. That, but I just think like, oh, so like, I mean, I would say that these artists are, are not curing diseases. They're making art and they're entrepreneurs in a way, cottage industry un entrepreneurs, and they're not curing illness. But I've done some volunteer work at the Chelsea and Westminster local hospital where I live in London, and they've done these clinical studies that living with art actually results in shorter hospital stays and lesser issuance of medications. So artists are in fact helping to, to, to ameliorate some of the ills, ills of society. And when it comes to art, part of the joy of art is to wake up and rub your nose against a drawing or a painting or a sculpture or turn on a video. So I don't think anything will ever get in that will ever supplant. I don't believe in art funds, art hedge funds, and all of this type of stuff, it's bullshit. And I don't think it'll ever succeed on any level other than being talking points. But people will always, since art came off the wall of a cave, it's been coveted and people really gain something from that experience on a day-to-day -day basis in their lives. So do you think you enjoy an artwork more because you own it or just looking at it? I don't think you can own, as another, I don't think anyone could own art. Art owns you, basically. You're a custodian for the art for your lifetime, and you have to ensure I have four kids, and I'm basically doing more damage from carelessness to my collection than my kids are, but you don't own art. Art owns you, and you're charged with the responsibility to care for it, and it's as simple as that. I don't like, it's not so much the ownership of art, because I don't get overly attached to one thing or another. As long as I'm surrounded by these things, um, that's enough for me. And I, well, I was just- that would be an argument for sharing it. As opposed I mean, to sharing it is great. I just don't think that it's going to... I don't think that people are going to buy a $150 million Modigliani and 27 billion people are going to own a thread of the canvas. I just... I don't see it happening. I see it happening. <laughs> okay. All right. Well... Um, <laughs> we'll call that an impasse. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's save that for next year, I guess. Um, <laughs> I, I want to go back to this, uh, this notion that you brought up, though, Simone, about... Um, these sort of different models for experience and, and future pace, which is the, the entity of pace that you brought up um, that deals with exhibitions like Team Lab and whatever else. Now, those are, in theory, experiences that people are going to, right? So do you think that they value those experiences in the same way that we were talking about at the beginning where things that have a high price are what's valued? Because it seems to me like if you're going to a new media installation that Team Lab puts up and you know that it's all digital images being broadcast around the room and whatever else, that's a different thing than an object that you can point to and say, oh, that Leonardo is worth $450 million now. Do you think it's the same thing, or do you think it's a... It's a different way. It's an evolution, but it's going to be a different way for art market professionals to operate, and it's going to offer artists a wider range of possibilities to express themselves, and they will be able to do much more ambitious projects than they can do if they only cater to private individuals who want to hang their objects in their homes. So I think it, in fact, widens the artistic experience possibilities of artistic expression. So I think it's a very good thing. And also we must realize we go towards uh, a society where uh, the majority of people will be jobless, will not have a, 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 a job because uh, of artificial intelligence. And so uh, the whole way of living and, and, and of society will evolve and it's offering this type of experience and these, these kinds of experiencing art which will make a big, big big difference. And uh, I, I loved your example about the Chelsea Hospital. I, I hadn't heard of that, that in fact it was uh, improving the, the, the medically the recovery of certain uh, patients. Because, like having a dog. <laughs> uh, uh, it's because music uh, has a, that same, same power. And I think that uh, therefore artistic expression, anything that allows artistic expression to blossom will be, will be a good thing. Well, okay, I, I will, um, I think that's, that's very well said. I will, one thing that I do want to mention though is to go back to the sort of fractional ownership issue. Um, this is something that I dealt with a fair amount last year and I was doing all these <coughs> blockchain conferences and I'll talk about that more in depth later. But um, I kept seeing the people who would start these, these fractional ownership ventures and they kept talking about how 
this was all about the experience for art, uh, the experience of art, and like buying a like one sixteen hundredth of a Picasso was a valuable experience of art, and I think that that's just an experience of money. Like that, that's just a transaction. That's not really like a. They're just trying to come up with another derivative to trade, right. like a guarantee. I mean, it's just another blockchain. Is it's all hype, and it's all again, it's just more of the same, hashing out another way to do the same thing, and I'm not convinced. No, but anything that brings you to look at art, whatever angle it is, is legitimate. Even if it is that you just want to spend $100 uh, on something and that you want your $100 to be well placed and therefore you're going to look at certain works of art, it's one of many, many different ways of having access to it. And whatever makes you look at art, whatever makes you take a decision of editing, is an artist, becomes an artistic choice. And I see it so often at the top end when you have people who buy, mo uh, some collectors who buy mostly for you know, wanting to have a good bottom line and, and, and from investing point of view, even the hard-nosed, most hard-nosed pure investors in the end get emotionally attached to art. You tell them now you should sell that and they say, no, 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 I don't want to sell it. I like it too much. And I said, y you seem to forget that you told me that your sole motivation was, was the bottom line. So I, I find that's the beauty about art is that you, at some stage, the emotional uh, involvement kicks in. Kenny, did you want to add anything there? Well, I, I mean, I just think for me, because I studied law, I never, like, I was always defining my career in terms of what, what I didn't want to do. I wasn't going to be a lawyer working behind the desk all the time. I wasn't going to have a job like this or a job like that. And casting around until I ultimately found what it is that I was interested in. And um, That was strategic. I didn't <laughs> see what you were doing. That was great. Well, I just think that like about all of this fractional ownership and... I mean, I just, again, I just don't, I don't buy into it. And I just don't see, it's just another, it's like a novelty of how to kind of break something down and turn it into another form of financial asset. And I'm disbelieving of it. Yeah. Okay. So I, that's, that's probably as much as we should spend on, on that subject. I think it's fascinating. But uh, one other thing that I, I think we should definitely touch on, and it sort of relates to, to all this, because when we're talking about this financialization of art, whether it's fractional ownership or whether it's, it's the, you know, highest amount of interest going into the most expensive stuff, all of that ends up filtering back to one of the hot topics in the art market now, which is this idea of a middle market gallery crisis. We hear about this all the time. And I'm curious as to whether you two gentlemen who've been around for a long time and who've seen various decades of the art market go through, like, do you think that this idea of a middle market crisis is justified? Or do you think that this is something that people are maybe, um, I don't know. I don't want to say imagining, but maybe they think it's worse than it really is or that it's newer than it is. I'll start before I forget everything I'm going to say when you start. <laughs> um, I mean, I've been, I've been 30 years in the art business, and I would say, I mean, there was a recession in, in the 90s where the market didn't constrict, but it evaporated. So I think that in terms of mid-level galleries today, it's never been easy to have a mid-level gallery. It's never been a situation where business was flowing and opportunities were rampant. It's always been an incredibly difficult, persevering type of business, and it's just never going to change. And also, when you think about, like, I mean, iPhones have only been around since 2007. Instagram, which has been one of the most fundamental shifts in the way people experience and, um, and, and buy art, et cetera. These things are so short-lived and the impact has been like a cleave into the whole system and history of art. So when you look at the model like MoMA, which was the clinical kind of uh, uh, architectural model for modern art, in 1929, MoMA opened with these kind of white wall stark environment to see art. And then you look at galleries and I mean, contemporary galleries as we know them today probably only started in the 40s, like with Betty Parsons and having this minimal aesthetic in which to kind of elevate uh, the value of art in people's minds when you're looking at a Jackson Pollock painting for a few thousand dollars and you see it in this kind of uh, environment mimicking a museum, it kind of ascribes a whole other level of value to it. 
So I just think that, I mean, all of this discourse and discussion about how galleries are today and what their plight is, number one, it's, it's been the same since galleries opened and it's never going to change. It's always going to be a kind of bell's curve of wildly commercial successful galleries, young, young, young emerging galleries and what's in between. It's never been easy and it never will be easy. At the same time, we have to think of new methodologies that will reflect changing times and changing technologies. So a mid-level gallery representing 20 artists doing fair after fair and trying to slog away and make a living, it's never going to be easy. So things are going to change and there's going to be new models coming up in the near future that we haven't even thought about yet that reflect on technology in other ways. So it's not, of course it's, it's difficult to be an art dealer without being Gagosian or Hauser and Wirth or one of these big players, but it's always going to be difficult, but I mean, in a way, what I was saying before, art, art is this strange field where, number on one level, it's a raging, cutthroat business where you know people will all but kill each other. Don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other level, art is like this kind of pursuit of knowledge and educational component. So there's like this weird disparity between what art is in a professional realm of what we're speaking about. It has this amazing side of just bringing joy to people and touching the lives of people and at the same time it's a business so what other field i mean that's what drew me to this to the art in the first place was the fact that there is this kind of altruistic side to it i mean we're all sitting up here for you know very little resources in the car on the way back on the way from the airport in barcelona i was with georgina adam and melanie Gurlis and uh, Eugenio and Simone, and we're like war reporters in the trenches. We do it for next to no money whatsoever when we travel around to do these seminars and these types of things, and I write for next to nothing, but we do it for something which is beyond business, beyond money. It's really for what you said, love, passion, and these kinds of things, which makes the hair stand up on my arms and makes me weep if I think about working with my children in art. Really, it's the kind of fabric that holds my whole family together. And I think that's what makes it so enticing that it is this kind of gambling casino filled with money and high stakes, blah, blah. And at the same time, you know, you're helping a kid like find a better life. I just want to take a moment to <laughs> they all let that sink in for a second. All right, Simone. Well, I, I do think it is becoming more difficult for some, some galleries because of the phenomenon of the art fairs. It's just so expensive to participate in all of these art fairs. And if you're a gallery nowadays, you can't count on the people coming, the foot traffic coming to your gallery. Your business will essentially be going from fair to fair. And therefore, uh, with the consolidation at the top end of the galleries, you will have five to eight sort of mega galleries. And for everybody else, it's going to be but more and more I wouldn't difficult. say it's a consolidation because I think there's more galleries today in the world than there was ever before. I mean, and again, like, thanks to things like Instagram, where it's democratized. I mean, when I started in the 80s, you had to send a sheet of 20 slides and look up in the sun to try to see the art that someone was trying to communicate from one person to the other. You had to put a stamp and write an address on an envelope, and that was the only way that you could communicate what you were doing from one venue to the next. And now you just turn on the phone and you see what's happening in every disparate corner of the entire world. And these types of things are contributing towards towards breaking down some of the barriers. Of course, like art fairs, you can get into like a three-day seminar on art fairs and there were, well, what was it? There was like 50 in the year 2000 and now there's 260 more or less. I mean, in a way these things are, they didn't just mushroom on their own, they mushroom because there's a demand. People have short attention spans, our attention spans are getting progressively shorter due to the phone and various things and all of the commitments we have and the quickness of information and life. But art fairs are there because they serve a purpose, because you could see 150 galleries in a short period of time. And at the same time, they're difficult for galleries and I understand the disruption in your family, the expenses, the traveling, I mean galleries, are doing like they could do between five and 15 art fairs a year, which is completely manic and mad. At the same time, it helps galleries to make money and there's an upside to it, otherwise they wouldn't proliferate on a certain level. So were you gonna mention something before that no. happened? <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so then, Kenny, do you think that, uh, because art fairs have definitely kind of become a, a, a whipping boy, I feel like, in, in the current structure. Do you think that they're just basically getting a bad rap? Because yeah. one thing that I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll broaden this out and make it probably even harder to answer. Um, 
But one thing that I, I always wonder about when we're talking about this middle market um, crisis or whatever is that like, how much of it has to do with the art market in particular and how much of it just has to do with the way that culture is moving in generally. Because you see the same thing happening, like it's happening in Hollywood, it's happening in popular music, it's happening with publishing, it's happening everywhere. And so that implies to me that when we see um, Art Basel and Freeze and these other major exhibitors saying, well, we're, we're going to solve this problem, we're going to give you a 10% break on your booth costs next year. I'm like... I, I mean, I, I think those are de minimis efforts. Those, that's PR, like when David Zwerner and company agree to like lower a gallery's fee for a fair from like $20,000 to $19,567 is not going to make one hell of a difference to anybody. They're just gestures, you know. There's nothing more, really. Um, also, like what I found is like in the past, when the market was raging and like you had this mentality of some of the proprietors of the fairs or like the freeze people could be tremendously kind of snobby, entitled, type, the kind of approach they have to letting people in the fair and out of the fair. When they're on top of their game and everyone wants to be in this particular art fair, their capricious behavior is downright stifling on a certain level. At the same time, now that there are so many fairs proliferating, I think what we're going to see, which is a positive thing, are the breaking down of the stranglehold by the fair. So now you've seen Freeze for the first time led in Nicole Klagsburn, who's closed her gallery, a mid-sized, very talented dealer in New York City. She closed her gallery for all of these reasons we're talking about, how hard it is for dealers to survive. But now it's not because Freeze is benevolent, because they're the opposite, but they're breaking down the barriers so they can just continue to have clients to rent the booths that they have as it gets more competitive and there are more and more fairs. So I think that we're going to see a humongous change in this kind of, you have to have a gallery for six years or you can't even submit an application. All of these types of things will break down where like I was just asked to participate in, in an alternative fair to freeze in Los Angeles called Felix, which will be at the Roosevelt Hotel. And they asked me as someone who's an artist and a curator and a writer, they asked me to take a booth and to participate. And I think the fairs will become more adventurous and not by any benevolent side, just because of economic necessity, they're going to be forced to kind of reach out to a broader base of people and make the fairs more reflective of the art world in general. Sound like I'm running for office. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, your campaign speech is apparently going to be the end of our uh, prepared remarks section. We're going to move it on to the Q&A at this point. So anybody out there in the audience who... I mean, not that anyone would have any questions about anything that we would have brought up during the course of the past 45 minutes, but um, I believe there will be a microphone going around. Uh, I would ask you, for the sake of trying to get as many people an opportunity as possible, please try to just ask one question and try to ask it as succinctly as you can. I will warn you that if you start going on a monologue, these fine gentlemen have had to put up with me moderating them for the past hour. I will moderate you. Like, <laughs> don't make me do it. <laughs> okay. We, we do appreciate if you could stand up so that the other people know who's, who's posing the question. Start here. Hi, um, I have a question about the virtual reality galleries because I saw that um, some showrooms online appeared and some galleries, for, exa for example, in Gagasian. But uh, what do you think about the future of virtual reality galleries? Like uh, even participating of virtual reality galleries in the art fairs, for example, not to bring all the art there, but just to bring one glass, like glasses, and just to show it to the audience. Just interesting because in the the future is here. So, like, um, would love to know your opinion about that. Thank you. I think it it could be very interesting. I mean, there was this art fair. Uh, that was only meant to be online. That's uh, five years or six years ago. VIP. And 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 sadly, uh, it it was a total failure because it collapsed when people, everybody was trying to get online, and then the whole thing collapsed, and so <laughs> the whole trust in it, uh, you know, didn't did not work. So people prefer to go to physical exhibitions. But of course, yes, if if there is a way that I can see lots of exhibitions that I cannot travel to the place, I would be delighted to do so. And uh, for the moment, I uh, use Instagram like that. I used to read art magazines, now I only look at Instagram in terms of seeing what's on different exhibitions or different art fairs around the world, and I have bought some several things, having first seen them on Instagram. So yes, I think these tools will definitely help. I, I agree. I mean, I think also, like, I've been 30 years, like, some of the biggest change, I've seen the small amount of humongous changes over the past 30 years, and 
One of them is the fairs. This other one is like how art is kind of morphed into this hybrid between luxury design. And like, if you look at this new hotel that these Fertitta brothers, these American brothers who made billions in cage fighting, have opened up a billion dollar hotel in Las Vegas and they've commissioned artists like Damien Hirst to create almost like a pastiche of things they've done before, which then occupies this weird space between fine art and design and luxury lifestyle living. But Instagram is one of the other things besides the expansion of the market into Asia and stuff. And I think that the phone, again, it's been here for such a short period of time, but it's, I mean, it's radically changed the way that we think about art and experience it. And these changes, I mean, again, like I, it's been such a brief period of time that we've had this, this, this phone and how it's really transformed our lives is only, hasn't even been attempted yet in all. Yeah, one thing that I'll, I'll add to this is just that uh, Simone brought up the VIP art fair, which was this totally online art fair that happened, I believe in 20, it was either 2010 and 2011 or 2011 and 2012. But um, if you look at what they were trying to do at that point, and that the technology just wasn't there, just literally didn't work. Now, uh, there was actually a piece that I wrote last year about some things that um, Gagosian and David Swerner are doing in their online stores. And they're basically doing all of the things that VIP tried to do six, seven years earlier. So even in that span of time, things have changed enough that what used to be sort of a fantastical idea is suddenly something that people have to at least think about. So I'd say that that, that bodes well for the future, or at least means that things will be interesting. Anyone else? Hi. Yeah, I'm sort of wondering that um, with this online platform of Instagram, what's the point in even attending these art fairs or participating in them? Do you think there might be a reversion back to the exclusivity of a gallery? <clears throat> Excuse me. Just being in a standalone location and having people come. You see, the fabulous thing about art is that, of course, you can see it on, in, in a beautifully produced catalogue, you can see it on a beautiful iPad, but nothing, nothing ever replaces the physical experience of seeing art, you know, firsthand. And even if you're a professional and you spent all your life in the art market and you see a work and you read what the dimensions are and all of that, you can have huge surprises when you see the actual work. And I see this season after season when I get all the auction catalogs and I make my notes in the catalogs and then I go and see the exhibition. So often I experience things completely differently from what I expected uh, would be my experience, despite the glossy uh, ca ca catalog illustration or despite the amazing close-up I had on the iPhone or on the uh, iPad. I agree. I, I mean, I bought a garbage can from Amazon and it came, it was about the size of a thimble because I didn't pay much attention to the, to the size of it, but nothing will ever, ever replace. I mean, you know, not in human relationships with masks and robots and all that, forget it. <laughs> nothing could ever substitute standing in front of a work of art, ever. Yeah, and I think that one thing that, that we're starting to see, I mean, we were sort of talking about the, the, like the attention economy and how that's affecting our experience of art, whether it's on Instagram or, or the way that we look at or don't look at art in, um, in physical locations. And something that um, one of my colleague, and I guess Kenny's colleagues at, uh, at Artnet, um, Ben Davis, has written about, is this idea of a slow art movement. There's like the slow food movement is something that has cropped mm -hmm. up over the course of the past several years. And people have felt like they're too, uh, in too much of a rush and there's this idea that we need to take time to really sort of enjoy things and, and process them in a way that we haven't been doing. And it, that strikes me as something that has potential. I mean, I don't know that it's going to happen well, across I, the board. I think that's a great but. point because like what people fail to, I mean, like you say, art is a slow burning process. It's a lifelong process of accruing information and experiences. And I mean, there were times when the market was red, white hot in 2007 and people were dressing up in prosthetics to break into art fairs early, to jump and get a jump to buy something before anybody else. But I mean, that's absurd ridiculousness because like, like you say, like, and when you stand in front of a piece of art, the process is just beginning. So, you know, to buy something impulsively, a painting for, I don't care if it's a hundred dollars or a million dollars, it's, it's ridiculous. You need to learn and to live with something or spend time with something and study it and think about it and see more. Uh, anyone else? Yes. Hello. Hi. So thanks very much for, for sharing all your thoughts. Um, I was having a conversation earlier today and it's actually kind of came up, it was sort of her question 
but I found it fascinating, <laughs> so I wanted to ask it. Um, we, it feels like it used to be sort of museums, which were kind of the space that uh, you would see most of the exhibitions and they kind of decided what counts as art history, for example. And now with the situation seems to be, you know, a lot of galleries doing museum type shows, um, museum boards kind of pushing for certain works to be shown perhaps. What do you feel like the role of the museum has been diminished? Has it kind of succumbed to the market? Um, and not in kind of art history as well, along with that? I think that's a super great question. Because, I mean, so much has changed with all of the advent of what we're talking about. When you think of critics, critics have lost their teeth. Museums, public institutions have no money, basically. So they, I was speaking to the Metropolitan Museum about an exhibition, and they had no money to paint the walls from one show to the next. And unfortunately, like, I mean, there are some instances where private museums fulfill an extraordinary role in a given society or culture, but there are other situations, like, does Los Angeles need a private museum or New York, where they have these phenomenal museums that have been around for decades, building up a constituency over the course of time, and then you have someone who's been in collecting for five years and splashes out on a big building, and it's like curatorship without scholarship. And I think the proliferation of private museums has come at the direct expense of museum museums. And like critics, I mean, galleries today have the power of permitting access to artists that people want. That's their power. And the collectors, investors, have usurped a lot of this, uh, this kind of the traditional role of museums and critics are losing their power. You see, the true way to immortality is through art and culture. Uh, it's only achievements in the cultural arena which may give you some kind of immortality or some kind of longe longevity. And in the old days, a collector, uh, his dream would be for his art works, for his collection to end up in an important, uh, prestigious museum. Now, uh, the big collector's dream is to have their own museum. So because the collectors dream of bigger tax uh, uh, <laughs> consider themselves as artists and a good collector is like an artist because a good collection uh, has, carries the handwriting of the person who put it together. And so the only way to present it in an undiluted way is to presented in your own museum. So this is also an attempt by collectors themselves, an attempt at uh, immortality. And uh, But of course, the question is, uh, fast forward, how many uh, of these ego projects can, can the world take? And, and in the long term, how is this going to play out? And, and, uh, one thing I want to expand on that Kenny mentioned is this idea of sort of the um, the fact that museums have no money. And like this, your question comes up a lot and I feel like a lot of times it gets siloed too much in the art world and it's a matter of like, oh well, why aren't curators making these decisions or why are, are galleries too influential in terms of what they can convince museums to put on? And to kind of take a further step back from that, what you see if you look over the course of the past 30, 40 years is that there is a kind of, as, Public funding has declined, private funding has ascended, and so, so much of what's happening in museums is just purely a fact of, or it's a consequence of the fact that we as societies are not funding public institutions in ways that we used to. And as a result, places like museums have a mandate to try to survive in any way that they can. And so it's not just a matter of, well, are the galleries getting so expensive that now they can sort of convince museums to have shows, it's like, well, like our tax policy means that we're no longer giving money to museums, or in some cases, at least where I'm from in the US, like healthcare or things like that. So there's actually a much bigger kind of structural uh, conversation that has an impact on this, but um, I don't think we're gonna solve that when it ta uh, talking galleries. Yes. So thank you for allowing me to throw this question. I've been recently speaking to private um, um, museum owners, and what one thing what was striking me after this conversation was that uh, um, public museums tend to conserve a artifact, an existing artwork, whereas these uh, private collectors I have talked to invested in an artist. So they they commissioned an, an artist for an artwork that wasn't existing. Do you think there's um, so there's a shift in in the uh, in what we want from museums? Maybe that they 
You know, it's more like investing in a startup, like what is mm -hmm. private, I, in my point of view, where I see public collections like conserve things that is already existing. Do you agree to that? Well, I think one of the most exciting things, if you collect art and, and if you can afford to collect it at a high level, is to be able to commission works and uh, from artists and uh, give, give them the means to uh, create works at a, of a scale or of an ambition they would otherwise not be able to do if they just do works for the kind of domestic art market. So I think it's a great, a great thing. That's what the great art patrons did uh, at all times. So uh, I think that's the ultimate uh, kind of thing when you, when you can commission things directly from artists. They can also commission things and give them to museums <laughs> rather than their own museums, if you ask me. But I mean, like it makes a lot of sense in places like China or jurisdictions where there's not a lot of public institutions showcasing international work or whatever. So, I mean, I'm not, I don't make a wholesale indictment of private museums. I think they fulfill an extraordinary role besides the fact that museums could work on a five year plus, you know, a scheduling program. So private museums have a dexterity and a, and a kind of flexibility that other institutions don't have. And again, they have more money, but I just think it makes more sense for some of these collectors in a jurisdiction like Los Angeles, New York, big cities, Rome. And I mean, better serve for people to help support existing institutions. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I, I lived in LA for 13 years and um, the Broad came up during that, that time, um, which is a major private museum in, in LA for anybody who doesn't know. And it quickly became, by at least their press releases, the like, best attended museum in Los Angeles. So for but, sure, it's a zero sum game where they're sucking out the audience of the main museum. Well, and, and part of the reason though is that they offered free admission and no other museum in the city until the hammer a few years ago, I think, um, was really doing that. So, of course, people are, if they're going to go to an art museum and they're not really art people, they want to have that experience, but they feel kind of excluded from yes. it, they're going to go to the place where they don't have to pay. They'll go to the place with the fascinating thing. Room. Well, yeah, right, that <laughs> helps too, but... The incredible thing with abroad, which I personally love because it's a fabulous collection, is that you just need to cross the street. Just cross the street. That's all you need to do to walk into the MoCA. Right. And while you have endless queues around the board, you go into the MoCA and you're by yourself, completely empty. And it is incredible that only a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the people who uh, queue for hours to get into the board will bother to cross the road where they can see outstanding art. Right. I mean, the difference is that they're paying $17 to get inside of MoCA, and they don't have to pay anything to get inside the program. But also, so I mean, also like you find in some of these collections, like in LA also, like the Marciano collection, a lot of it just seems to be like box ticking, like, oh, yeah. I want this artist. They're all like night sale. You know, they look like an auction catalog, some of these collections. So they, I just find the depth lacking in some of them. They're vanity types of things in some cases. Uh, yes. Hi, um, maybe for Simon first. Um, I was just wondering, this is purely conjecture of course, um, Christie's privately owned, doesn't need to divulge as much, Sotheby's publicly traded, acquired art agency, very controversial. Um, how do you see it panning out? Which, which model works or fails for an auction house? You mean to be private or public? Yeah. It's probably easier to be private, uh, I would say, uh, because uh, as soon as you're public, you have a degree of scrutiny that you would not have if you're privately owned. Um, is that your question, just about the private or public, or is it uh, about doing all these different things? I, yeah, I think branching out, what gives you the most flexibility uh, as a business? I, I think it's uh, perfectly legitimate that they try and, and do many different uh, activities. Uh, it's like if you told a big bank you're only allowed to do this kind of banking and not of any of all of these other types of, of banking. I think it's perfectly okay for uh, a big art company like the, the big uh, auction houses are to do you know, a different range, offer a different range of services. And in a way, I'm very, I was always surprised uh, while the main auction houses do all of these services, while the, why the main galleries don't do auctions, don't do all of the other things, nobody prevents them from doing it. And uh, I, that's what I find uh, surprising in a way, because uh, the, the big 
top five or top six uh, uh, galleries, they could do all of the above and just as well. But I think, I mean, I think also, I'm sure Christie. Huh? What? <laughs> all the gallery was connected to an art to an auction house was rejected to art fair. It's part of the the roles of art fair. That's the old. Uh, uh, yes, maybe rules, it's the but old, now. but that was the, 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 the reason until now. But you are right; it will maybe not change. I also think Christie's is just window dressing. It was to not go a public. choice. I think Christie's is on their way to going public anyway. That's why they've been buying market share and suffering losses in some of their biggest sales, so they can just build their books and their public perception to, to go public like Sotheby's. Anyone else? Oh. Just scream. But, but I think there is a big hypocrisy, uh, you know, about uh, uh, auctions and, and, and uh, art galleries and that. Uh, <laughs> I remember many, many years ago, the Kunsthalle Basel, when I was still at Sazabis, asked me to conduct an auction during Art Basel. And then uh, when this uh, auction was announced, all the galleries uh, really reacted and, and had a huge protest. I mean, very, very strong uh, reaction. So much so that the Kunsthalle backed down and said, okay, the artworks that we've obtained for, the, for this auction, we will not sell during Art uh, Basel. Uh, we will sell it in October. But could you please nevertheless come and we will do an evening with a lot of artists there and we only sell hot air and for each bit of hot air that you will be selling, each artist will do a different certificate. So it was an amazing evening. It was very hot. It was in June. And uh, I sold a lot of hot air during that night. And then all these artists uh, made these certificates for each purchaser. And then in October, they asked me back to sell the artworks that had been donated to the Kunsthal in Basel. Well, let me tell you, the hot air auction made six times the price of the auction when only the local Basel population was there in October. So obviously, um, when, when you have a big event, like when you have either a big art fair, it's good for everybody. Same thing if you have a big auction week, it's good for everybody because everybody flies in for the auction, then they go and do the round of the gallery and vice versa. Big art fair and all that, they go and, and look at what's at the auction houses. We are all dancing around the same honeypot, all of us. And so, uh, you know, these barriers saying, oh, uh, 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 we are part of the institutional world, we are part of the commercial world, no, we are part of the auction world or part of the uh, uh, gallery world, this is all hypocrisy. Everybody is, uh, you know, behind the scenes, working exactly in these areas. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I get carried away now, but uh, mm -hmm. another uh, thing which had nothing to do with the question. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Yes, uh, this is uh, about something, Tim, you comment. When you say that we as, as a society um, are not funding anymore, or as we used to, uh, museums. Well, uh, directly, yes, but indir indirectly, uh, no, because all the tax breaks we, you know, uh, are given to collectors and whoever is funding. It's, it means that it's money that doesn't come to for tax revenue. So it's not that as a, as a society we we are not funding it. It's more like I don't know. This is a question: Are we giving now more power to private interests? You know, in the museums, in comparison to. I don't know, before, uh, because there was a big budget uh, from the state, uh, let's say maybe more in Europe than in the US, uh, professionals would have more uh, a say into exhibitions and acquisitions than today, because today there is a more direct link uh, who is funding and um, uh, in, who is in power, in a way, in museums. And so the role of curators, art historians, um, on all those professionals maybe are being secondary. This is also a provocation and just <laughs> want to, to know your comments. And I know it's a very difficult topic. I have um, some difficulties in approaching people in the field uh, to talk about this. So just 
Well, I mean, I, I would I would say that there is no question. And, and granted, all of my answers are are an American viewpoint on yeah. things. Like I know much better how things run there as opposed to. And this is uh, well, apparently this is going to be the last thing that any of us says. So I, I apologize. Neither one of you is getting the last word. Um, but I don't think that there's any question that private interests are gaining much more than public interests really in any vector of society at this point. And that's naturally going to impact the arts because so much of what the arts have been throughout time is um, a sort of investment in something that doesn't have any direct tangible benefit from it. I mean, you can't invest, unless you're talking about the market, I mean, then you can say we can invest in a Leonardo and sell it for $450 million somewhere down the line. But otherwise, culture is something that is supposed to enrich our lives in ways that can't necessarily be measured. And in an economy and a kind of culture that we've built now over the course of however long it's been, certainly here in the 21st century, I think there's a, a extreme focus on direct outcomes. And if you can't prove that something directly benefits a, a person or a culture or whatever, it gets harder and harder to say, oh, that's something we should spend money on. Like people want to be able to point to numbers and want to be able to point to direct returns. And that's not really what art is about. It's never been what art has been about. And it's never going to be what art is going to be about, I don't think. So we're naturally at a disadvantage in that kind of economy and this kind of thinking. And that means that we have to be more creative. We have to think about things in ways other people aren't. And I guess that's why we have events like this to try to figure out how the hell we do that. <laughs> so, I guess that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.